Longtime viewers of the show will know that here at the Bitcoin Layer, we have a special focus on credit and interest rates. And here today to discuss both of those with us is Matt Dines. He's the co-founder and chief investment officer at Build Asset Management. Matt, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thanks, Joe. Really excited to be here. Likewise, likewise. We, I am a, I'm an avid follower of yours on Twitter. I think your uh, insight into markets, particularly as it pertains to uh, treasuries and the U.S. Treasury uh, and credit are are sublime, second to none. Um, I, I get a lot of signal from the things that you have to say. And so uh, for us here at TBL and our viewers who really uh, have an appreciation for rates and for credit and how that plays into the, the wider macro picture, uh, I'm really excited today to to chat with you about uh, about some of the happenings here. The, the first thing I want to get started on is uh, the yield curve inversions that we've been experiencing. So obviously, um, they, they've made up a lot of the headlines uh, on CNBC, on Bloomberg. All of your favorite business pundits have been talking about uh, curve inversions. Um, what is uh, obviously a rhetorical question for you to explain to our viewers, uh, but what is a yield curve inversion and what is its signal? Yep. Well, first off, I'll say, Joe, thank you for your kind words um, uh, at the front of uh, that question. Um, I'll just say this. I, uh, I'm lucky to be in a position where I'm sitting at the screen trading these markets. You know, I have up here, up here, monitoring. Yeah, you've got the screens in front of you. Investment grade credits. I could come up here and show you, you know, 10 BWICs I could respond to right now. And I would just say, like, the just having your finger on the pulse uh, helps you understand where things are, where they're trading, um, especially in these most liquid, I would say like liquidity, liquidiest of uh, credit markets out there. So U.S. Treasuries, first and foremost, and then, um, I mean, IG Corps, uh, where I mainly focus. Um, if you look and at for the viewers, that's invest, investment grade corporate yep. bonds. Yep, investment grade. Um, basically anything, you know, any one of the three ish, uh, major uh, reviewers, rating agencies, um, puts a triple B minus or above. Um, but the question on what is a curve inversion? Um, so long story short, it's basically when um, the yield on a um, government debt of a shorter maturity is above those of longer maturities. So when this happens is particularly interesting. Um, it's happened, you know, d depending on which curve metric you want to pick, right? And right now you've got, if you plot the yield curve out for the U.S. Treasury, it's not a smooth shape that you could fit with, you know, a, a parabola, something with uh you know, a, a second order polynomial. This is this is a, a weird, gnarly um, S curve, uh, big hump up front, bowed out in the middle, uh, slanting down, and you see some some uh, just undulations uh, lately where, you know, the, the ultra long end, the 30 year bond, the longest bond the treasury issues wants to come up and down above the 10 uh, even. So a lot of interesting things going on. Um, but the big normally, one right? normally curves are positively upward sloping, um, yep. and, and they they are that way uh, because obviously uh, uh, investors demand uh, a higher yield uh, the further they uh, lock up their capital, right? So obviously, treasuries trade on the secondary market, but the assumption is that if you are just an investor and you're holding um, uh, from uh, all the way through to maturity then you're going to want a higher yield the, the longer you're locking up your capital. Um, and sort of a, an inversion is when those longer tenors or those longer uh, time periods that you're going to lock up your capital uh, in a bond or a note or a bill, um, uh, it's yielding lower than, than shorter term paper. And uh, what, what sort of distortions does, does that signal? Because I have my own thoughts about it, but I'm curious to hear yours. Um, a distortion, uh, that's... A distortion implies it's something that shouldn't be happening. Um, I mean, it's take it for what it is. I think it, it, it the the word is uh, more in line, like it's 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 not supposed to be that way. Versus what the conditions, what the trades, what the hedges going on in this treasury market are telling you about economic conditions over the forward-looking six, twelve, twenty-four months. Um, but what you typically see when this inversion, and I'll, I'll just pick, you, know, you can pick any curve inversion you want. Some, some are focused on more shorter end versus the intermediate part of the curve, the 10 year, uh, I would say, versus some look at the, the, the long end versus the intermediate. But um, the key one, and this is 
really important to like the collateral and credit creation of the system are the the front end rates so you could you know the, the most common cited is the 210 but really to understand what's going on in collateral you got to look at the bills market which is one year and inside on the u.s treasury non-coupon issued denominations um, and that's that's really an important indicator of what's going on but what you see in the bills market the front end of the curve is the yields are going up um, and, and they went up aggressively over the last, uh, let's call it 12 months, um, versus the 10 year, while it did rise violently from like a one to one and a half percent range where it traded at most of 2021 up to three and then four, and then it's come back in pretty aggressively over the, the last few months. But basically with that inversion, um, the way it gets started is typically it's happened 10 times i'll use i'll use the the curve i've been following the most everybody picks their own favorite inversion metric i'm looking at the three month tenure why it's really tracking where's the bills and then where's the long end right where's the collateral in the system uh the most popular collateral in this in this um uh global dollar system uh where are those at versus where is uh the key benchmark rate for for mainly consumer loans, corporate lending, you know, long term or longer term financing in the government, which is the 10 year. So you see where those those are trading. Um, and what we see typically uh, we've seen we've seen 10 inversions there. We talked about inversions, 10s in the post World War Two environment where you really have this dollar based global financial economy really kicking in, accelerating and growing exponentially, you know, unabated for you could say seven decades, right? 1950 to 2020, but it really kicked off in the 1970s and then coming out of the 70s, so 80s up until, let's say, 2022. Um, but what you see with this inversion, typically it starts at the top of the hike cycle. The, the front end yields will sell off faster uh, than the than the back end of what, of what the, uh, the specific uh, rate spread or curve spread you're looking at. Um, and that's what we saw this time around. Um, this uh, this current three month ten year inversion it's sitting at about um, I want to say yesterday it clocked in a, a minus 120 bips, right? It's a it's a it's a massive amount of spread for historical uh, consideration. The only times we've seen it more inverted are uh, really you're looking at the 1970s. You got to go back in the chart. Um, so typically what you see on these inversions, right, you, you, you actually saw the Fed funds hiking um, start to create. They, they really kicked in the, the inversion uh, on the three month tenure kicked in basically last June when we saw the, the really aggressive 75 bips rate hikes that rate hikes. Um, we saw, you know, the CPI prints, if you recall, last April, May, June, they were you know, very sharp. Um, I think we clocked in the peak, you know, above nine percent. Um, and you saw an FOMC shift into the the ultra hawkish mode and kind of stick with it for you know multiple 75 um, bips rate hikes um, at the uh, FOMC policy meetings. So in that time frame, we've just seen that curve deepen, uh, which just meant the the front end sold off faster than the 10 year rose over that time frame. Um, so we haven't yet peaked uh, on this ever. We may we won't know until we've printed more, um, you know, chart on the tape. Uh, but where we sit right now at negative 120 bips, you know, give or take inverted, it's historical level. So the other times we saw these curve inversions pre 2000, pre 2007 or pre 2008, you know, the, the inversion actually peaked 2007, um, 2019, uh, uh, Q3, we're at levels pretty far beyond that. So it's it's telling you certain things and we can, you know, shift our discussion and, and talk about what that might be telling us. Fantastic explanation, Matt. And the, the, the beautiful thing about the yield curve is that via the investor positioning, you you know that something is amiss in markets, but it seems to, to uh, uh, be something different a lot of the time. Um, you know, it, it, it signals that something is is uh, is wrong and, and the curve inversion itself is not a distortion. As I mentioned earlier, that was probably the wrong word. It's more so a signal. It's a mm -hmm. signal based on investor positioning of something, um, you know, in uh, in 2019 that happened to be a, a, a collateral shortage. 
um, you know, in 2008, it was something else in 2000, it was something else. And then, you know, uh, so on and so forth. And as of right now, we're at historical levels, uh, historical levels of inversion, and we're still there. Um, and so let's talk about some of the things that it could be some of the things that it might be. Um, talk to us about the amount of dollars in the system. Uh, as of right now, you know, we're coming off the tail end of uh, the most aggressive uh, QE, QE4, or QE3. I think it was QE4. Um, and now we're, we're tightening, uh, the, the Fed's tightening its balance sheet pretty substantially. Um, what is this doing to uh, liquidity within the system as a whole? Is liquidity at risk right now? Talk to us a little bit about that, uh, bank reserves, so on and so forth. Yeah. So talk about... Um the metrics we have a good understanding of or good measurement of dollars in the system sticking to the domestic commercial banks um every week um the federal reserve you know takes note uh, measures all kinds of metrics basically every grouping on the the balance sheets of commercial banks um and there's a line on um this this report is called the h.8 publicly available they release it um, it's weekly, but they release it like two weeks delayed. So the numbers we have now will be from uh, mid-January. But on that report, there's there's a line item on the liabilities of the commercial bank's balance sheet. Um, top of the stack, most liquid liability um, are demand deposits, right? And, and at banks, they've, they've got them kind of bucketed into two, two, two groups. There's time deposits. So it might be something like a CD, money that's kind of locked up for a set period of time at the bank. They don't have to, you know, release these funds overnight. You know, the, the you know, households and firms, you know, who are the clients of the commercial banks can't 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 move the time deposits readily. But there's another line, the other deposits, and this is where uh, what you'd think of like our checking accounts, right? What all of our dollars, you know, just just in the checking accounts. These are the dollars that can move uh, based on everybody interacting with their commercial bank accounts in the onshore. Uh, um, you know, call it FDIC banking system. Uh, but what we saw in 2020, uh, in 2021, um, I mean, it, it's to call it just a tidal wave of liquidity in terms of like deposit creation is, is not an understatement. If you look at the charts, um, there, there's no precedent in the, the history of these reports for, for what happened in 20 and 20, 2020 and 2021. Um, got some metrics here, but during COVID, like we increased deposits in the system up 50% growth in 12 to 18 months. Right. Um, and just for, for benchmarking in, in the, in the GFC, you know, as, as Lehman collapse, uh, we had to kind of reliquify, um, the commercial banking system to, to get that balance sheet expansion to kick back into gear as you know, the Lehman collapse triggered everything to, to contract upon itself to stop that. Um, the deposits creation there was plus 32% in that time frame. So you see these impulses, but COVID was just, it was even another, another level over, over Lehman. Um, so you think about that, that growth rate and, and where it kicked us, you know, off of the trend line growth in the chart. Um, it, we're so far ahead and there's, there were so many dollars just sloshing around. Um, and if you think about it in a time frame of like, where did those dollars want to go? Right, because in most of these commercial bank deposits, they're still yielding zero, and, and they always have been since the GFC. Um, you know, I have I bank with Chase, my checking account, you know, what you pay your mortgage, all those other you know, grocery bill, all those out of. I think they're still still paying one bip on those. Uh, last I checked, uh, even with T bills, you know, rising to four point five. Um, so those dollars need to find a home, right? Um, eventually, if you know, at some point you have too many and that's where the system was. Um, and you know, the first wave of those, we saw it go into, I mean, um, the 2020 rush we saw in 2021 or 2020 and 2021, people were buying goods for their home, you know, uh, Amazon, just orders going crazy, shipping containers from China, just, just volumes off the charts, prices off the charts. Uh, those dollars went into goods and that turned into inflation, right? I mean, we saw it in the CPI. Um, and then you see the services wave in 2021, the next thing happens. Um, and now those impulses are slowing down, right? We get, we, the dollars went into goods, 
dollars went into services. They also, at the same time, went into financial assets. Uh, we saw a massive spike in, in risk assets like, you know, SPY, QQQ, ARK, Bitcoin, everything, like every asset was in a just bull market in 2020, 2021. Um, now, though, those things reversed in 2022 as you know, the Fed realized like, hey, we've got to sop, sop up some of this cash. So what do they do with that policy response? First step was actually increasing this facility called the reverse repo uh, facility. What does that mean? It's kind of the opposite of a repo transaction, but it's a, it's a centralized facility where, um, you know, whitelisted players, I would say, you and me can't go and, and deposit our money in the repo or reverse repo facility. Um, but say you're a money market fund, you have access to this facility, you can park your cash at the Fed overnight and get a, you know, high rate overnight um, on your cash. So you do things like that to sop up some of this cash and you ever, a lot of people on, you know, Twitter, et cetera, Bitcoiners, you know, are aware of this reverse repo chart. It just goes up and to the right. I think it's sitting at about $2 billion or sorry, $2 trillion right now. Um, and just cash that they accept uh, or that the Fed accepts overnight uh, to, to, to basically sop up that liquidity. Um, and then you see it go into T-bills, right? It starts, you know, T-bills start selling off and to attract more cash, um, it starts pulling into T-bills or it starts you know, to attract more cash of, of those dollars into the bond market. Rates sell off and they're, they're, they're pulling in that liquidity. Um, and that brings us to where we are today at an interesting point where um it looks like that that goods impulse right catching up to supply chains those backlogs that kind of looks like it's resolving we've got six months now of cpi on a very clear downslope um you know you're seeing the services you know um you know special metric you know there there's a lot of nipping tucking grouping of the of the uh the, of the cpi buckets so you know, the, the FOMC can point to like, hey, this is going well, or we're really close to being at target, or maybe we're too far away, whatever they want the message to say, they can, they can group the calculation to come up with a vector that they want to show uh, for where CPI is, but it's, it's mostly coming down on goods, um, or it has been the trend is for six months, um, you still see elevated, you know, in the household services group grouping. Um, but mostly, it's very clear, like, prices on the decline. Um, so we're, we're kind of getting through that impulse. We saw the same thing with the kind of cash liquidity leaving risk assets and in, in um, 2022. Um, and now I'd say is an interesting time where you're seeing a lot of signals that, um, you know, those flows being pulled into the bond market. Um, you know, we talked about the rate hikes, you know, pulling that, that three month 10 year spread, that inversion. Um, sucking that, that cash liquidity out of the system. Um, you're getting some signals that we might be nearing an inflection point where it's gone from cash abundance to um, relative scarcity. You're never going to know for sure when you cross that line uh, from, from one to the other until after the fact um, you get more signals. Uh, but there, there's, there's, there's a lot there that we're getting ready to enter the next stage where um, you know, it could look like a pause, a little flat growth, choppiness, whatever, um, to the next, the next, next thing, uh, which would be, um, how does this curve uninvert? 10 for 10 on the incidences since World War II. Um, and you've been great, you and Nick, uh, Joe, covering this at TBL. Um, it comes down through rates, the front end rates coming down. That's the only way it's resolved. Call it a, um, a bear flattener. All right, or sorry, 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 a, a, a bull flattener on the yoke curve from the front end uh, getting bit down. Um, the only other way you could see that inversion flip back to a positively sloping yield curve uh, would be a sell off in the long end. That that hasn't happened in the post World War II dollar cycle. Not to say it couldn't, uh, but it would be telling you something um, very different. Uh, from, from kind of the landscape we, we talked about right now in terms of de demand for dollars. We can go down that road of what a, what a sell-off in, in the long end uh, might imply. But right now, it looks like there's a ton of demand for auctions on the longer end. Um, you saw uh, a record amount of buying um, in terms of indirect 
uh, ten, both tender bids and accepted bids on the three-year auction. So, it, and, and it's been happening in, in other auctions as well, the five-year, seven-year, 10-year, and 30-year that the Treasury holds every month to set the on-the-run curve, uh, which is basically just the newest issued bond uh, for each maturity. Um, but you've seen a massive amount of um, international buyers for those for those bonds at the Treasury auctions, which is kind of a signal. Like it, the 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 demand, uh, the pressure downwards on the curve is starting. Um, you could say it, at the minimum, it's starting in the intermediate term of the curve, and it's working its way inside. So it, it looks like we're going to see um, another one of the other ten, um, as opposed to a. Uh, you know, something like it could be this time is different. Like, don't don't rule that out in your in your probabilistic outcomes. Um, it could happen, but it it looks like um, you know this cycle will be a continuation, if you will, of of uh, medium to long term historical precedent. Right. So this curve on inversion is going to be led um, with the front end uh, getting bit up more substantially than the long end and, and thereby yields on the front end dropping uh, faster than yields on the long end, which will uninvert all of those key curves. Uh, the three month, uh, obviously b between collateral um, and, uh, and, and uh, the, the key reference rate on the long end, the 10 year, um, and also uh, another really liquid instrument on the front end, the two year and the 10 year. And we're seeing the two year <clears throat> begin to fall quite materially now. Um, and I think uh, you know, it, it, it's our view at TBL that, that that's going to continue and that's going to persist. And the front end is, is really going to lead the dance there in terms of uh, getting bid up so substantially that, uh, you know, it, it eventually falls through uh, 350 or wherever uh, 10s are right now. I believe they're at 350. And then we, we finally see those key on inversions. Um, that's really great. That's really great stuff. We, we appreciate that explanation. Um, we appreciate the, the, the insight into treasury auctions and that um, you know, there's there's tremendous, tremendous demand uh, for auctions as of right now. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the fact that we've seen the reverse repo facility flatten out over the last several months um, and there are all these auctions that are stopping through, uh, it, it seems only a matter of time that eventually, um, you know, the, the sell pressure gets subsumed by buy pressure uh, when it comes to T-bills. Um, and then eventually that leads, uh, you know, the, the, the rally um, and, uh, and uninverse all of those key curves really really great stuff let's talk about credit spread so we so we began this conversation by talking about everyone's waiting with bated breath um mm -hmm. looking at these inversions thinking okay what's what's the impetus for this huge cataclysmic event um is the impetus in credit as of right now uh, typically i mean for the cycle we're seeing um which is we're talking about the the, the, the treasury cycle right where we're talking about all this stuff inversion uh, uninversion, you know, bills sell off, bills rallying. Um, typically, what happens is we see the credit event after we go through that cycle. T bills selling off. It's the collateral in the financial system, right? Um, and then, and then they'll come back in. They come back in after the fact, and it, it means something, right? It means there's a rush towards um, the safest collateral in the system. We're done with the sell off. Um, it means the system is actually, sounds weird to say this, so something's increasing in price, but it means the systematic risk is, is, is actually increasing, right? Um, so the rates coming in as a signal to uninvert the curve, it's typically uh, kind of a precarious situation across asset classes. You don't see it Kind of materialize and across every asset class the same way every time in the you know ten events we've been through uh, one of these, um, but generally it's a it's a it's a it's a situation for kind of like higher heightened uh, systematic risk and and kind of the global credit environment you know centrally the dollar credit environment uh, which is where most of the the world's debt stack um, is denominated um, so the way everybody's kind of watching this you know you see all of these reports everybody's um you know all geared up watching b read s read you know the liquidity crisis there what's going to happen um you know even this report this week um started last week with a story about adani india like you're seeing these these um you, you know credit distress you know little pockets you know maybe maybe individual issuers um and we can go through 
you know, there have already been um, some high yield bankruptcies filed. Um, nothing, I believe, in IG yet. Um, and the, the IG kind of defaults are, are, are more rare. High yield in, a, in this credit cycle, it's 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 guaranteed. You're going to see defaults. All I say, nothing's guaranteed in life, but you you do see them. And in the case of past cycles, just to really interject quickly, in the case of past cycles, you've seen uh, the the three month T bill, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the yield on that top out several months and sometimes even several years before we get yeah. that coinciding spike in credit. So, like when it comes to credit, this isn't something that could necessarily be imminent, um, but a credit event is undoubtedly it, again if we're using history as our judge, which is the only thing we can do. Um, will undoubtedly be on the horizon. Uh, it's simply a matter of when and, and how severe, I suppose. Yeah. And it takes time to digest, right? And I'll say that the, the distress, the defaults, just to finish that thought, you've already seen them. As I said, it's guaranteed. It is guaranteed because BBBY, Bed Bath & Beyond, um, you know, missed payment. We can go through individual like defaulted high yield securities that, that, are, that are already out the door. So you're seeing them pick up. And if you look at the, the Bloomberg Bankruptcy Index, um, you know, the tracker of, of just defaults, like it's ticking up. Um, now, if you just look at the chart on a one year or two year horizon, it looks like it's going up big. But then if you zoom out on a 30 year chart and you see a credit event, it it goes really high. And we're just not there yet uh, where you have like broader set of defaults in the economy. But then to, to tie it back to, to, to your last comment, these this takes time. Once we get to this point where the, you know, the primary collateral in the system, the T-bills kind of the, the yields, the sell off on those is done. Um, it, you know, of the 10 scenarios, the average time, once you cross over into peak inversion, um, it's one year, uh, on average time to, to get back to the positively sloped, um, yield curve. And I'm using the three month tenure as, as the reference there. So if you benchmark that, you can use all the different spreads. Um, it's going to be about the same thing you, you measure. It's gonna, it takes a year to digest. It's about a standard deviation of half a year on those 10 events, small sample size, right? But it's it's been anywhere from six months from the peak inversion to, all right, the system is flipping uh, and we're in the, the mode where the, the front end, there's a rush into the safest collateral um, in, in the bills area of the curve. Could be six months, we saw a couple of those, and then we saw one that was two years, right? In the 89, 90s, as kind of the stress in the system. And I was, if you go back and read the tape, I was, uh, you know, a toddler, uh, in that one, but the situation in that one was, was, was pretty unique. The situation, the, the, the treasury curve inverted, went into distress. You had the Saddam Hussein situation, uh, with Kuwait. Um, and that was a long drawn out situation. Everybody thinks they, they remember desert storm as this three day war, right? It was just in and out. Um, the actual geopolitical situation, um, it was a lot of slap on the wrist and it took a long time to get to the point where we were sending in aircraft carriers and, you know, conducting the uh, military operations. So the whole thing, you know, it's a, it's a good reference for what we're seeing today uh, with a hot war in Ukraine. These situations, um, both the Treasury market, the the kind of the ge geopolitical front, the global economy that's annexed all into this whole, you know, soup, um, it takes time. For, for the kind of the, the slow drip. Uh, but the point is usually, you know, everybody's watching for the credit events and, you know, we're, we're ready. You know what I mean? Like it feels like the traders are, you know, a lot of FinTwit, everybody is like, it's happening. Or, you know, Bitcoin is like the credit events right around the corner. It's, it's going to be March, 2020 tomorrow, or it's going to be September, 2008 tomorrow. It's like, no, if we get there, it probably takes time. Now the, 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 the pace at which it, it does is just, situation by situation each of those 10 is different we're in a unique setup at this point no one knows kind of what clock this this thing's going to move at but it's probably in front of us as opposed to everybody right now thinking you know you look there was a bit of a, a spike we call it oas as a as a spread measure it's just kind of a fancy word to come up with a guess on what should a credit that's not a U.S. or that's a non-U.S. Treasury, something with credit risk. Option adjusted them. spread, if I'm yep. not mistaken, right? Yep, correct. And it's just what you're going to get in extra yield uh, versus versus your Treasury curve. So we did see a bit of a spike there um, in a couple 
quarter, especially June um, of last year. But I don't think if you go back and look at the chart, you know, Bloomberg's been publishing this index. I think it starts in 1989. When you see a credit event, like a systematic credit event, it's it's big, right? And and what we saw in 2022 wasn't wasn't really one of those. I think the furthest that it widened out was uh, one and a half uh, points on uh, on investment grade or uh, um, uh, and or, or or average OAS across investment grade yeah. and high yield and. Um, if if you if history is our judge, that is not the credit event that we are looking for. Uh, to 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 quote Star Wars, I suppose you know it's not yep. the credit event that everyone's rallying around and saying, "Well, we already got past it in 2022 with minimal defaults." Like that wasn't it. I think yeah. the, exactly like you said, the market is positioned and they're so hopeful that it's already happened. When in actuality, you know, the, the brunt of it is is likely ahead of us. I would I would say that's correct. If we get one, what we saw in 2022. What, what, was probably not it. Indeed, indeed, a blip on the radar. Well, um, you know, let's talk about let's talk. We already talked about sort of cash on the sidelines. Uh, uh, let's talk about where that cash is being put to work. Uh, talk to us about some of the uh, some of the new issues. Uh, you know, where uh, where capital is flowing as of right now. What auctions are looking like? Yep. Um, so we talked about. Uh, the rates coming in a little bit. I don't think we cited exactly where Treasury sold off to. So we saw, you know, 10 year, 30 year uh, US Treasuries get up to the 4% to 4.5% uh, kind of range in the in the heat of the sell off. You remember last September, October, we saw sovereign bond issues, um, especially on the long end in, um, you know, uh, Great Britain um europe um jgb's japanese government bonds all of those were dealing with trouble we went through a little bit of a patch up it was you know especially uh with the bank of england um kind of uh stealth qe gave these uh pension plans time to resolve an issue with the sell-off just asset liability mismatches because the bonds sold off so so much um, they needed to delever, and to delever, they had to sell more, more of their um, government bonds, which just increased the cycle. So the Fed, or sorry, the Bank of England came in with a pause, and that kind of set everything in place where we we got a chance to breathe. We got the sovereign bond markets got a chance to stabilize, and you've seen um, kind of rates come in, um, especially on on the the U.S. Treasury curve, especially on the long end. Um, have started to come in uh, pretty significantly um, in terms of price appreciation. It's even more like 75 bips on a 10-year or 30-year bond is you know a pretty strong rally um, for that type of duration. Uh, but just to, to bring my thought in on the thread, so these the you know the long end of the curve has come in. The volatility there has also come down. The 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 move index is uh, an index that tra- tracks the kind of the price volatility of um the treasury market you've seen that go from really histo- historically elevated levels um throughout most of 2022 as the sovereign curve was just selling off we call it a, a rate sell-off um just throughout the year that's come in you've seen the 10-year and 30-year lower now um and you've all which makes things more attractive for new corporate issuers or not, not new but IG corporates, especially, uh, to come to market with long bond issuances. So 10 year, 30 year, um, you know, focus deals. No one's raising right now. Um, you don't see this when a new issue comes to market, uh, from a, a corporate bond issue, especially, uh, with like a two year or a three year, um, chunk of these, these multi-part deals. Uh, when I say these, these, these deals, let's say like Oracle yesterday came with a, $5.625 billion deal um, to take out a bank loan that they use for the Cerner acquisition as well as retire another piece of debt outstanding. Um, th- there was no two or three year. No one wants to issue um, a corporate bond at the top of the mountain on the yield curve where you're going to be indexing off of the treasury and paying 4.8% on the two year. You're just not going to sign up for that, especially, you know, the, these CFOs are you know, paid to watch this and kind of know what's coming around the corner um, in terms of co- timing their their debt stack. 
Um, As we're really reaching the zenith, um, yeah. you're, you're going to see begin exactly. to see corporate issue issue, issue and slow down. Right? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I think this might be actually a window where where mm-hmm. corporate issuance picks up gotcha. and potentially does well. So they're 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 tapping the long end. They mm-hmm. want to see the ten year and thirty year deal now that you can you can raise money. The markets are open as of January, especially um, for for these raises. And and if you benchmark on the yield curve, you want to pay you want to benchmark to a lower rate, right? So the the ten year is the lowest point on the yield curve right now it's coming a lot the volatility is down so the issuer of debt is incentivized to get get things done especially while this window is open we don't know how long it's going to be open either when the treasury curve starts uninverting that's probably a sign that we things are going to get tight again um but you're seeing a massive amount of of uh you know, corporate pickup or issuance pickup in the corporate space. Um, yesterday, this Oracle deal I cited, uh, the 10 year and 30 year pieces of the deal were, I want to say like seven to eight X over like covered or bid to cover on those, which just means the amount of interest that the bookmakers got on the deal was eight times what the borrower had to raise, right? It's a, it's, it's a massive amount of demand. Um, especially for that long end. So where the treasury comes in on those bond issuances, right? When they do a monthly auction of a 10 year and the 30 year, they get about, they've been getting about 2.5 X on, on covered for, for it's a bigger issuance. They, they do like $40 billion relatively for a 10 year and a 30 year, like that ballpark. So to come in for Oracle with, um, you know, a couple of billion and get eight, it's not an apples to apples because the treasury auction is much bigger, but it just shows you there's a massive amount of demand right now from that cash on the sidelines to get to work for 10 years, 30 years on a credit that, you know, I'm not going to say for sure that Oracle is going to be around in 30 years, but there's a lot of them that, you know, for a fact or like high probability are so on Microsoft, um, I don't know if we wanted to sort descending on the list of chances for companies to be around in 30 years, like the, the, the probabilities are a little bit fuzzy. I mean, there were IG bonds 30 years ago for Sears, like doing this for Sears and JC Penney, and we know how those turned out. So it doesn't always work out. Um, but the point is there's a ton of cash on the sidelines to get locked up, uh, at these rates that are, um, historically like elevated, especially for the last 15 years of, you know, where most of the, the, the people running this money have, have, have been and seen, um, these are what we view as high yields and they've got liabilities to lock up a lot of them or projects to finance. Um, and you know, both sides, um, you know, kind of see a, a, a happy, um, middle period where you're going to see issuance. Um, and if the curve continues to come in, um, these bonds are going to perform as opposed to last year where you're in sell off mode. You got a few deals out in January, February, um, you know, ahead of the, the, um, you know, the start of the war in Ukraine, but those deals did terribly for those investors, right? You, you put, you put money to work at, I mean, the 10 year was still one and a half percent range at the start of last year. You add a, corporate spread that was at the low end of the historical, you know, percentiles for where these things land. Um, I'm just looking at the chart. It was inside of 1%. So one and a half plus 1% max, you're gonna get two and a half percent on a 30 year bond. Um, let's say you got ripped apart in 2022. So those deals didn't do well. And this year it has the potential to be, and we're just getting started It's January, but those coming out, let's say the, the, the yield curves are coming in now. Um, you get the, you get that money out there, this cash can go to work and the deal does well, right? You're going to be marked up <laughs> over weeks and months instead of watching your position bleed to death and be down 20, 30%. Um, so this could be a, a good environment right now for where we're at in the cycle for, for, you know, corporate issuers, uh, bond issuers who, um, have a high likelihood of, um, not getting into that distressed territory that we're talking about. When this curve uninverts, um, things get dicey in the system. Distress happens, defaults pick up, et cetera. Um, so 
could be a could be a positive backdrop actually surprising to say for for credit in this environment but as always tbd it's risky uh the further you go out on duration um the more price risk your bond is going to have um and that's just where you're trying to catch the right c's or a lot of these people or a lot of these firms entities that are that are actually buying these they're they're immunate they're immunizing a liability let's say it's a pension plan right um we've seen this from corporate uh corporate pensions, they're extremely uh, well-funded as opposed to our public pension system, which is, uh, I would just say the exact opposite situation in terms of underfunded uh, uh, status uh, and, and problematics. It's region by region, but we can go through a lot of those. But these corporates, like their corporate defined benefit pension plans, they have a long-term time horizon. They have a, a large employee base um retired employee base they got to pay for they got to immunize these liabilities they need to you know project out where the cash is going to be uh to meet the health care needs benefits all of that in 10 20 30 years um and at these rates you know they're they're clicking by now and add to card and you know get these bonds on their balance sheet so um some uh, to some extent the, the the volatility is something they're they're more inclined to, to handle. But the, the, the drawdown of a minus 20% in 2022, no, no one likes seeing that on a, on, a, on a bond position. Well, thus far, Matt, this has been great. Um, our viewers, I think, are really, really enjoying this uh, to, to get sort of the, the look on what liquidity is looking like, what credit is looking like, and sort of dispelling some of those market-wide talks of uh, an imminent credit event, uh, an imminent... Um, you know, uh, blow up a deflationary bust in one form or another. Um, and it's good to understand that for now, issuance is going well, liquidity conditions are fine, credit stress is very muted. What, one thing I do want to talk about to close this out here is uh, treasury funding. Uh, quarterly refunding docs for Q1 of this year were just released. Um, and uh, a couple of things of note. Uh, within that. So obviously, we have the debt ceiling approaching. And I think our, our viewers will be really eager to hear uh, uh, what the Treasury's uh, potential paths are. But as of right now, uh, on the latest refunding docs, uh, the Treasury had receipts of $1.026 trillion. Uh, so, so what it was taking in, and outlays, net interest, outlay, uh, interest outlays of $1.447 trillion. So that's net interest outlays of uh, 04 to one trillion dollars uh and uh we have a debt ceiling approaching uh and we need to uh we're going to be increasing new issues uh as as the u.s treasury so this is a this is a pretty tense situation all told um when you saw these documents you know break it down for us with the debt ceiling approaching net interest outlays continuing to rise um what's the picture how do we go forward from here it's, it's complicated. Um, I will say uh, the staff workers in the U.S. Treasury, not the ones you see talking on the screen uh, or, you know, uh, the t talking heads giving the reports, um, they're hard at work right now, um, kind of like the, 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 the corporate finance arm of, of your business, trying to get the cash management to work. Um, and there's another small subset of employees that are feverishly toiling away at whose face will go on the one trillion dollar coin. I'm sure. Oh wow, yeah. I mean, that'd be such an honor. Um, I think uh, to be graced with that 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 privilege on what what is clearly the world's most valuable theoretical asset. I, I just they must be clamoring over that. That'd be quite um, remarkable. I think uh, the the front runners are. Uh, our Jerome Powell for his uh, th thus far successful attempt at a soft landing, um, and uh, and probably Sam Bankman Fried too. He was uh, he was a good state asset until he wasn't. So they, uh, I, I didn't know they worked for the Treasury Department, but they could be on some sort of off books uh, type of deal. But they definitely don't show up on the the, the W twos. Um, but yeah, so the Treasury debt ceiling. You've got a, a segment of this debt. It's a, it's 31 trillion. I think the one decimal is 0.4. Um, but that that debt outstanding, once the Treasury hits that, they can't increase nominally the debt owed to the public, right? Um, Grant, when I say that, so there's a chunk of the debt, about 7 trillion, that is intergovernmental um, debt obligations. 
there's no security involved. And when I say a security, I mean like a, a QSIP, an IOU that is market tradable. It's like a, an, an accounting entry. It's a book entry. So a big example of this is um, kind of the federal government pension plan. And then there's a postal workers pension plan that piggybacks on it that get special kind of, I guess you call them treasury obligations, but it's treasury debt, but there's no QSIP attached to it. It's a, it's an IOU that gets entered into the books and records um, of the retired employees, you know, pension plan for these federal workers. Um, and, you know, just same way that, you know, private sector, your, um, you know, weekly pay stub will show some line item. Hopefully everybody's saving in some sense for retirement. Um, you'll, you'll show a line item come out that nets out your gross pay down to your net pay. It's the same thing for these retirement workers, right? They see some, some line item come out, but there's no bond actually bought in this portfolio. Like the same way in a 401k, if I want to say like, I increased your, your retirement savings by hundred dollars this month in our private, you know, 401k plan, some security has to be bought, right? You, you show a fund, a ticker symbol on the fund, and then you dive deep on the fund. They own, you know, a share of Coca-Cola or the bond for Microsoft or the, the treasury QSIP itself, something it's there. These are just book entries. So what the treasury's done, um, enacting extraordinary measures, extraordinary is the, the word they, they use to describe, Janet Yellen uses to describe this. Um, they delayed booking those entries from January, I believe it started the 19th through June payroll. So the federal, um, you know, public employees, they will not see technically on the back end. And if you, if you really wanted to dive in on your pension plan, wouldn't show those book entries, um, until June. And right now they're saying, Hey, you're, you're accruing those benefits, but we're not going to book it. Trust us. We're good for it. Well, that's one way you can make this this debt, like you don't have to record that number on the seven trillion of intergovernmental debt, like debt you owe to yourself, um, or federal government agencies owe between themselves. So, the fancy term I would use for that one is, is um, in air quotes, moving money around. Um, it's just you know you got to do these things to keep the lights on. You know, Rob Peter to pay Paul me here. I'm going to pay you here. I'll get you back when I can. Accounting yeah. tricks yeah. in in the death throes leading into the debt ceiling, playing some accounting tricks. Yeah. And one thing they also noted, not not to cut you off, but they they cited slowed economic growth in response to the Federal Reserve's efforts to reduce inflation through the tightening of financial conditions. So obviously, uh, the Fed's allowing Ooh. Treasury to roll off of its balance sheet um, via its uh, obviously the SOMA, its portfolio, its holdings of U.S. Treasuries. Um, is the U.S. Treasury blaming the Fed in part, at the very least, to shift a little bit of blame over over across the road uh, on what's happening here with the decline in receipts? Well, in the document, they they literally do. <laughs> they, they, they blame the Fed tightening on the lower receipts um, as opposed to, you know, the policy stimulus. All of these actions in 2020, 2021 created a massive amount of capital gains um with the run-up in risk assets that you know you if you look at the chart of um federal receipts uh in 2021 2022 it, it was a record in 2022 due to the, the activity in 2021 so i think you know if you read a document it's in writing they they literally posted on the fed uh this is your fault for for hiking um it's not necessarily a combative tone yet but it is the you know there's their if you if you played athletics at any point in your life is there a reason is there an excuse well they're both the same thing um but some someone's got to, someone has to claim responsibility for or, or put responsibility on on the other thing um but whether it's infighting or not i think the whole point is right now i think at this point this junction we're at is really where the rubber meets the road and we're gonna where we're, we are going to have to make when I say we, FOMC, Treasury, et cetera, it's at this point, the decisions are getting hard, right? You have to make a sacrifice. You have, if you're Jay Powell, you either have to keep rates high, right? Or, or cut them. Um, and like, so there is something to give up. You, you either have to keep running your, your quantitative tightening policy or give that up. Um, and there are real consequences of that now. 
uh, they'll, then they'll become deeper and deeper um, in the same way the Treasury now is dealing with constraints, right? They can't just go out and say, we're going to raise as much, you know, trillions as they want um, without impacting the debt ceiling. They're going to issue a lot of, tra of, of, of uh, billions in debt. $932 billion is the new raise. Um, they picked up that number versus their prior guidance. Think of this the same way as a corporation gives quarterly earnings guidance. Then they tell you what they see the next quarter looking like. Um, this 932 billion was a big step up. I, uh, the exact number, it's, it's about 300 billion more than what they said or where they saw it being um, in October uh, at the last quarterly re refunding doc. So they're going to need to raise more. They're assuming QT will continue to happening. An interesting uh, finding as you keep diving deep on this um, and asking the right questions on how the how the machine actually works. The Fed balance sheet holdings, there's an account called SOMA, Systems Open Market Account, that's actually doing all the buying of the, the treasury bonds or and bills um, as they come in. And they own mortgage backed securities and other stuff too, other debt, uh, other credit. Um, those don't count against the debt ceiling. So it's, it's kind of a nice little, little uh, cheat code. You don't have to count those against the limit. Um, so with the, with the QT runoff, it's actually working against the treasury's favor, uh, favor, I'd say, uh, in terms of making this problem harder on how do I keep the, how do I keep the lights on? How do I keep this thing running, uh, with that debt ceiling staying exactly where it is? The QT is now push comes to shove. We've hit the debt limit. It's, it's, it's a real constraint. It's a problem. And that's, I think where you get into the point where, you know, one building in Washington, D.C., the people now involved in the financing of the government and solvency, et cetera, are, you know, standing in the way of another. And what happens when push comes to shove? Well, the easiest thing to do is Congress kicks the can down the road um, and say, we're going to raise the debt ceiling. That's got to be the base case for what happens. Um, you know, otherwise the, the default is. Um, it's a situation I think I think most people involved in the system want to avoid, um, but it's a it's a window where if you're in Washington D.C. and you're one of these power brokers, you can you can do some horse trading and, and get what you're looking for uh, out of this negotiation. Um, timeline on that for when it would come to an end. Um, Goldman Sachs research report in um, late December said you know getting ahead of this. They could probably, with these extraordinary measures, extend out the you know, government financing at the existing 31.4 trillion uh, to go through, let's say, July or August. So fuzzy crystal ball we have between now and this June to 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 get this thing worked out. Probably gets worked out. I mean, just, that's got to be the highly likely outcome, base case assumption. But there's going to be trade-offs. Um, trade-offs made. So. It's, Part of this cycle, it's another wrinkle. We were talking about the curve inversion, what you have to respond to as a treasury investor, uh, which is really, if you're a credit investor, if, if any debt market, which is really everything. I mean, it's just what this thing touches is is every, everyone and everything um, in terms of daily life. We just don't all know it. Um, there will be wrinkles along the way. There's some, there's some other really interesting stuff too going on with um, the repo market transition. I'm sure everybody's heard of the term LIBOR. Um, the way that specific market operated, um, it's been a policy focus for at least a decade, uh, that the fed has wanted that to be deprecated and move towards a new, uh, reference rate that floating rate loans can, can kind of benchmark to. Um, and that's happening with this, this market called SOFR, which is, you know, secured overnight funding rate. Uh, which just means we're going to start tracking floating rate or we, we intend to start tracking floating rate um, debt to repo markets, collateralized repo, collateralized with re uh, U.S. Treasuries. Right. So shifting uh, away from a, 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 um, a key financing rate, an overnight yeah. rate that was unsecured based off of unsecured uh, collateral and now SOFR, uh, yeah. which is a rate off secured. And, and to bring me home, that's happening. It it the drop dead date, the deprecation, it's June of this year. I mean, there's a lot of things yeah. happening in the next three to six months. And it's going to start hitting the the, the, the CME, um, largest exchange for, for futures and commodities trading, but one of the biggest there for, for global markets and hedging. One of the biggest contracts historically is the, the euro dollar futures. 
those are going to be deprecated and all of those positions are going to be migrated over into SOFR futures on April 14th, day before tax day. Um, so we've got a lot of things um, in motion here and, and what's going to happen. And, and the other thing too, on this 932 billion that's going to be raised, part of that is assuming QT continues, um, but the the Treasury's Advi Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee has suggested that they don't advise increasing the issuance on the long end. So these auction amounts, I said like 40 billion ballpark for a 10 year note or 30 year, right? Um, those are going to stay exactly where they've been um, since last quarter. The remaining funding is all going to come out of bills. So one month, two month, three month, four month, six month, and 12 month financing. We're just going to put it all on those, um, you know, short term financing. It's the highest yielding part of the curve. Um, get through this next three to six months or whenever the the big bargain or resolution happens out of Washington, D.C., the way these things always work, it'll go to the last minute, uh, expect it to, uh, and, and and then they'll walk it back. Um, but, uh, well, it, it's an interesting wrinkle. So you'll see more bill supply, assuming the Treasury is able to, or does it create as much marketable borrowing as, as they uh, suggested in this uh, quarterly refunding doc. Um, but all else equal, that means more, uh, basically, amounts to raise at each, au each auction, which all else equal means, well, it's probably gonna have to clear at a higher yield uh, from the mm -hmm. supply side, but then you've also got the demand side from the international buyer, especially that's pushing in. So where this thing that's out, we may not be at that peak inversion yet. It, it's TBD. It can still- We'll like, see, we'll see. You know, if, if the treasury is funding itself primarily with, with bills and, and that issuance is rising, then obviously higher issuance puts upper pressure on yields, exactly like you said. But exactly. um, you know, if that demand comes in to, to meet it, it could be sort of a um, a battle there. So that'll it'll be interesting to say the very least to see how it nets out. One last thing I wanted to to ask you that we, I think we can leave viewers on, and I think is a is a little fun, uh, not thought experiment, but potential outcome um, to to leave viewers on. And uh, it certainly isn't our base case here at TBL, but it's an interesting scenario nonetheless. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you, we, we spoke earlier that the commodity prices have rallied alongside risk assets since uh, October. Um, obviously, commodity prices falling, that was sort of a tailwind that that helped CPI peak and has helped CPI uh, since come down. Now, uh, it, it looks like it's becoming consensus that CPI is 100 percent peaked. We're starting to see uh, those stickier components of the basket begin rolling over, too. Um, should this commodity uh, rally continue, uh, what could that mean for financial conditions in CPI over the next several months as we head into June when we hit the debt ceiling and as we transition into to silver as well? It seems like confluence of crazy events. What happens if this uh, commodity rally continues? Yeah, um, exactly. And it's hit. Not every commodity is up. I mean, the, the two big ones that stand out as being down uh pretty significantly since this this easing of financial conditions, this rally since October, nat gas and, and, and wheat. And there are probably a few others, but those are big, um, which is all right, uh, that, that that might mean there's some slack uh, from energy and food on two pretty core um, inputs to, to both of those two things, food and energy, which are which are key. Right. And, and, and especially the most volatile components uh, of the CPI. But across everything else mostly i mean you've seen rallies in copper which is which is highly correlated with gdp dr copper everybody calls it copper spiking ooh, uh, that's a sign price is probably coming up or or growth up somewhere um steel rebar arbob gasoline iron ore uh sugar like you could you can name it like there's been a huge rally across commodities um and it just kind of goes to show like you expect that to trickle in at some point into cost into the final good consumption good of of firms or households um otherwise like the only way out is profit margins go down and let's be honest, no no one wants that right everybody's got to maintain their profit margins um so you're running into a situation where all right this is the 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 joker was in the deck right it's, it's that type of situation like i didn't know that was in there i assume we weren't playing with the jokers um CPI impulse comes in. At the same time, you've got the the dollar cycle. We thought like, all else points to dollar cycle pointing to the the, the curve um, 
coming in. The pressure bills, collateral getting scared, like it's coming in. So imagine a world where we see growth down, demand for dollars up and, and, and prices rising again. That's a, that's an interesting economic wrinkle for policy to deal with. Um, and I think who knows, um, and, and, and that kind of back in the mind scenario, um, if you're Jay Powell and you know, that's, that's a card in the deck and just my assumption is they have better data than, than you, me and everybody else is working with. Otherwise, what's the point of being <laughs> of this institution, right? They, if they're trying to centrally run this, this, this economy, this financial system, and that's the goal and it, money, right? If they want to run the money, they should probably know better. So if they're watching that risk, that could be something they're watching. It's like, this is why we got to keep rates higher for longer. Um, so we'll see if it happens. I think the markets will be, will be the sign on that, but you know, we thought, you know, six months of declining CPI year over year, bring that back on a new impulse would, uh, kind of be a little bit of wrench, uh, in the machine. And that's where, that's where I think things get interesting. So if that situation materializes, I'd say it's probably hold on to your seats. Indeed. We'll all be holding on to our seats in the, in the next several months here. Uh, what a great discussion. Um, on, on everything going on currently. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of great signal for our viewers colors a lot of the macro credit rate picture very, very well. Um, thanks so much for coming on, Matt. Uh, where can people find you? Yeah, um, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is uh, at BuildCIO. Uh, my firm, uh, Build Asset Management. We're fixed income specialty, but what we really try to do, like, I think everybody post 2008 saw something happening from a mile away. We're focused on fixed income, but trying to help the kind of the retirement saver who has to go into that class. How do they preserve their purchasing power? If the existing financial industry tells them you gotta be, you gotta be geared towards bonds. Um, it's a tough place to be, but that's what we focus on. Our firm is getbuilding.com or our website is getbuilding.com. Uh, we just hit our three year track record, uh, as, as a manager. Um, yesterday. So if you look in the industry, everybody wants to see, do you have staying power? How did you do over three years? If you have enough data points, um, you, you kind of get a sense of, can, the, can this firm uh, do this? Uh, are they competent? Um, so the, I, won't, I don't want to talk about results here, but we hit our three-year track record. The results are, are, are very good. Um, I'll, I'll say that. Um, you know, across, you know, GIFs compliance, all of that. I don't want to get me any, any trouble. Uh, but I think we've set out what we're trying to do um, on the mission, um, help, pe help people who need it. Um, you, know, you hear a lot of retirees saving for income. I need yield uh, is kind of the most thing you hear uh, from a retirement. I need income to find my lifestyle. I'm on a fixed income, um, uh, my, my grandparents used to say. Um, but we're all out to, to help that person, hopefully, and, and others through this kind of tur turbulent time in a, in a late stage credit cycle. Um, and Joe, I think just, you know, getting to know you on Twitter, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been fun. I think the last, it's probably been about a year, I think, since I first uh, started interacting with you, but hopefully I'll see you at, at Miami this year. I'll be down at the conference there as well. We didn't oh, even I'll be there. there. I'll be there. So great. I'll be excited to see you. I missed you at Pacific Bitcoin. So hopefully you get a chance to catch up. Likewise, indeed. Yeah. Excited to, uh, excited to catch up in person. And uh, let's do this again sometime. It was great. Thanks again for, uh, for coming on. All right. Thanks, Joe. Take care. You too.